church. Good morning. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 1 through 4. While you're searching for it, I want to kind of introduce things with a little story. Not a great story for me personally, but uh, kind of a, a, an embarrassing story from the day I got my driver's license. Okay. A little bit of context. I grew up in a different country, so I learned to drive in a different country. And uh, traffic laws in Bolivia are more suggestions than hard and fast rules, like inconvenient things like stop signs. Uh, not, really, not really paid attention to all that much. But so I, I learned to drive in a foreign country. I came back when I was 18, so I was already older than most kids when they first get their license. Took me a couple of tries to, to get it down. First time I forgot to wear my seatbelt, and that uh, apparently you can't pass a test if you don't put on your seatbelt. But I finally passed on my third attempt. Third time's a charm, and I finally passed. And I was so excited. I just started dating Mindy. And so I was excited to let her know, hey, I can take you out tonight, and I can drive you, and it's amazing, and it's, it's uh, this thing. So I was driving home, and I wanted to tell her, and I could not wait, and so I did what you're not supposed to do, and I pulled out my cell phone. Now, this was 2005, so think about cell phones 2005. It was a flip phone, so I got to flip that sucker open, and I was uh, you know, texting where you had to hit like four buttons to get to one letter, and so I was texting. I took my eyes off the road for maybe a couple of seconds. And in that time, I completely left my lane. I drove off the road, up onto the curb, crashed through some bu bushes, and then eventually hit a street sign and completely uprooted it from the ground. It came flipping over my windshield, and I came to the most terrified panic stop I've ever had in my entire life. And I'm 18. I just got my license. I'm thinking, they're going to take it away on day one. I, I, I had it like three hours, and I've already lost it. It also happened in front of my church, and so the pastor and several other of the staff were out there watching the whole thing, and so that was great. The sign that I hit, the irony of this, is it was a sign that was very newly installed that said, don't text and drive. <laughs> and I make light of this, but it, it was a very serious thing. I, a very, I mean, God protected me in, in this whole situation. More, he protected other people from me. There could have been somebody on the sidewalk. It could have been a horrible thing. So I finally finished my text to Mindy and said, by the way, I'm not taking you out tonight. I'm not driving ever again. Uh, since then, I've, I've become a much better driver, partly because of stories like that that I learned. You take your eyes off the road for a second, and, and you've lost all sense of where you're going. You lose all sense of direction. It taught me the danger of drifting off the road. In one text message, I mean, just a few seconds my tires were completely off the asphalt. And church, I want, I want to kind of liken this into our spiritual lives. It's the same thing. You take your eyes off Jesus for just a second, and your whole faith starts to drift out of control. There's a constant temptation, constant temptation in our lives to take our eyes off Jesus. And when we do, our hearts begin to drift as well. I want to show you what that looks like in just a few places. Before we jump into Hebrews chapter 2, I want to show you a couple of places what, what this practically looks like in, in a person's life to drift away from the faith. Revelation chapter 2 says this, Jesus is speaking to the church at Ephesus, and he's saying some good things about them. He says in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your endurance. You cannot tolerate evil people. You've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. You've found them to be liars. I know that you've persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name, and you've not grown weary. He's saying good things about this church, but then verse 4, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at the first. Remember then how far you've fallen, repent, and do the works you did at the first. So he's looking at them saying, listen, you, you're doing the work of ministry. Your, your eyes are on, the, uh, on all these different things and you're, you're persevering and you're, you're getting things done, but you don't, you've drifted in, in your love for me. You, you, you've taken your eyes off me in this. Second example, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Uh, Paul is wrapping up his letter to Timothy. It's the last thing that he's ever going to write. He is close to his death, and he's asking Timothy, please come and be with me in, in the time of my death. And he says, verse 9, make every effort to come to see me soon. Why? Because, verse 10, because Demas has deserted me since he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. So you've got the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy saying, listen, the only companion that I have took his eyes off Jesus and he put him on the things of this world and he left me behind. 
The third example that we have in Scripture is in Mark chapter 10, and it's a long section from 17 on. But in, So what happens is a young man, a wealthy young man, comes to Jesus and says, I want to follow you. Just tell me what I need to do. What do, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus dialogues with him, but Jesus knows his heart, and this is what Jesus says. Looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, and what church? Do you know it? Sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. But, verse 22, the rich young ruler, he was dismayed by this demand, and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Where were his eyes focused on? On his things, on worldly wealth. And so instead of keeping his eyes on Jesus, he should have. He should have looked at Jesus and said, nothing else is more valuable, and so I'm going to leave everything. I'm going to sell everything. I'm going to give everything away. I'm going to follow you. Instead, he said, I, I, I got to go. I got to go. I've got too much. There's too much to lose. I have too much that I can't give up. And then, church, even as we go into the month of October and celebrate Reformation Month, this, is, this was the purpose of the Reformation as a whole to reclaim and recapture the truth of the gospel because the church for a thousand years had drifted away from the truth. And the reformers stood up and said, enough is enough. And they brought us back, the, the church back into alignment with the truth. It is so easy to drift out of control. And it doesn't start big, it starts small. And then you turn around and say, I don't, I don't even remember, I don't even know how I got this far. Our text in Hebrews 2, 1 through 4 this morning, it's going to specifically show us how to avoid drifting away from Christ. How do we avoid this? This is the first of six warnings that the author of Hebrews is going to give his readers. Scattered throughout the book, there's six warnings, and this is the first one of them. And I want to be really clear with you this morning. These warnings are not meant to discourage them. They're not meant to embarrass them, and they're not meant to punish these people. He, I, wanna, I just want to say this. He's not yelling at them. And I say that specifically because I had a conversation with my daughter Chloe this week. And I, I love bringing them up. And she's always like, oh, again, okay, it's me again. Okay, here it is. It's, it's either Sophie or you, so today it's you. But we, she casually said something about me yelling when I preach. And it started a little conversation. And so I looked at her and I said, well, you know I'm not mad when I'm preaching, right? And she went, okay. And I said, now I'm mad, but I want you, I want her to know, and I want you to know, I get excited when I preach, I get passionate, and I get enthusiastic, but I am not mad at you. Please understand, I hope you don't come and be like, he yelled at us today, and it was really aggressive, and I don't know. I'm not, I'm excited, I'm, I'm exuberant to preach the gospel, but this is, this is the writer of Hebrews, he's looking at these people, he's not mad at them, he's not yelling at them, he's not discouraging them, he loves them. He's poured out for them, and he knows that they have been persecuted. He knows that they have suffered at the hands of the Jewish people around them, and so he looks and says, listen, stay the course. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep moving forward. Keep your heart fixed on that Christ is greater and that Christ is better. So I'm going to try not to yell today, but probably I'm going to yell ten times more. But this is his first warning, and it's a warning against drifting. The so warning against drifting. Chapter 2, let's read. Let's stand to give honor to the reading of God's word. There's a lot of important hermeneutic clues in this, and we're going to take some time to unpack this, these first four verses. But chapter 2 says this, For this reason, or your version may say, therefore, we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard so that we will not drift away. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord and it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. Church, that may seem like a small section, but there is a lot here. Austin, we're going to unpack this for like 45 minutes. An hour, hour and a half, let's go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing to understand and to apply and to obey his word this morning. 
Heavenly Father, we come before you, especially on this first Sunday of Reformation Month, and we, Lord, give you glory and honor and praise that we, Lord, have the truth of the gospel, and we have it unadulterated. We have your word in, in, in its, in its uh, Lord, beauty, in its uh, perfection. We have your communication to us, and it's amazing that you even would condescend to communicate with sinners like us. But we know your love for us, and we've experienced your saving grace, and so we come to you giving you praise and honor and glory that you accomplished the the objective of your incarnation, which was to save your people and to provide justification for us. But then also, Lord, we give you praise for the last 2,000 years of church history that you preserved your word and preserved the gospel, and you raised up men like John Wycliffe and Jan Hus and Martin Luther, John Calvin and John Knox, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Spurgeon. You raised up these men to preach the gospel in its, in its purity so that men could be saved and that the, the unbroken chain of the gospel would extend throughout the ages. Lord, we're so grateful that we are recipients of the gospel, that we had the privilege, the great privilege of hearing, of repenting of our sins and believing in the name of Jesus. This morning, I pray that everything that be done and every word that be said And every song that that we sing, Lord, I pray that it would all bring you honor and glory. And I thank you for this time. I ask you, Lord, to open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to understand, our feet to obey as we dive into your word. We love you and we thank you. We give you praise. It's in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our church, you can be seated. So we're talking about about drifting away from the Lord. And and listen, I, I don't know your heart. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're sitting in this room, and this is the first time you've been in church in a long time. Maybe that's you. Maybe you just said, oh, this morning, I, just, I feel like I need to go. And maybe this is the first time you've been in church for a long time. Maybe you're here every Sunday. I don't know the condition of your heart. So this could be one of two things for you. Either this could be four ways to keep from drifting Four ways that we can look and say, okay, I don't want to stray from the path. I want to keep going. Or this could be, Four ways to come back to the Lord if you have drifted. And again, if that's you this morning, go to the Lord in repentance. Ask him for forgiveness. There is mercy available. His mercies are new every single morning. Never fear. A lot of times I think we we go through tough times and we go through seasons of... uh, kind of dryness and thirst in our spiritual life, and then we're afraid, well, will he even take me back? Yes and amen. He will take you back again and again and again. If you sin 10,000 times a day for the next 10,000 years, he will, he will have mercy for you and grace available for you. So this could be four ways to keep from drifting, or this could be four ways to come back if you have drifted. The first one I want you to see is this in the text. Understand your salvation's price. Understand your salvation's Price. Look, look at this in verse 1. For this reason. All right, if you're a student of Scripture, what should you ask in response to that statement? What reason? What reason? For this reason, what reason? If your version says, therefore, what should we ask in response? Why is it there? What is it there for? Okay, this is an important hermeneutic clue. And how do we discover this? We look at the context. We look back. So what he's saying is, I'm about to make an argument on something, and it's going to hinge on what I just said. So we're going to go back a little bit, especially to verse 14 of chapter 1. So he's talking about angels in that whole section, and he's not done with angels. He's going to fold it into the next uh, conversation, even continuing on into chapter 2. But he's just talked about angels. Verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve whom, church? Those who are going to inherit Salvation. I believe that is what is in focus here. Is, so, so given this, that, that this is the ministry of angels to point us to the fact that Jesus is greater and that he has accomplished our salvation, our justification, given that, for that reason, now let's talk about this. So catch those last two words, inherit salvation. That's what I want to focus in on, those who are going to inherit salvation. What he's saying is consider this. How do you inherit salvation? Were you just fortunate enough? I, I, when I was a kid, I don't know if you did this, but when I was a kid, I always dreamed, like I would daydream, and I would say, maybe I have a long-lost uncle who's just a billionaire. 
And he doesn't know me, but he's going to write me in his will, and one day I'm going to get that call, and it'll be like, hey, you just inherited, you know, $5 billion. How crazy, out of the blue, right? It's not going to happen, and that's fine. I've come to that conclusion. However, looking at it like this, how do, how do we inherit salvation? Is it just something one day we turn around and be like, oh, wow, I didn't even know I was in the will, and now I, got in, I inherited salvation? No, it was purchased. Your redemption was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what the author of Hebrews is, is giving as, as his first way to avoid drifting is this. Think about the high price that was paid to redeem and to ransom your soul. He's talking about inheriting salvation. He's saying consider the great price that was paid to atone for your sins before a holy God. Think about it. What did Jesus go through? We talk about this, we, we talk about this in, at Easter time and then we kind of forget throughout the rest of the year. But what did he endure specifically to achieve and to, uh, to provide salvation for us. The cross. He was, let's go through the list, he was betrayed and he was arrested. He was mocked. He was tortured. He was put on trial, a phony fam, uh, sham trial that, that wasn't legal by any sense. He was humiliated and paraded in front of people for the, for the express reason to, uh, to abase him and to bring him down, he was eventually executed like a common criminal, naked, hanging on a cross. He did those things, and I bring that up, why? To make you feel guilty about it? No, to encourage you to see he paid a price for you, a high price. It cost him his very life. And so when you think about your faith in your life, and we think, I'm going to try so hard to stay on, on track, and I'm, I'm going to try so hard to, to march in a way that I'm going to follow him, but the truth is, you're in his hands. He paid for you. He purchased you. You're his slave. You're his servant. So when I come to him, and I, and I think about my life and my sin, I think, you know, he paid too high a price. For me to drift away, he paid with his blood. That should give us the motivation, church, to stay the course, to not drift away from him. So given, given this, the extravagant cost of our redemption, what is the author's advice? For this reason, what does he tell us to do? Or this original church, what did he tell them to do? And us, by proxy. We must what? Pay attention, <laughs> pay attention. How many times, guys, how many times do you hear that in class? Hey, to, yeah, Hayes is like definitely every day at least once. Right? Pay attention. Why? Why does somebody have to say pay attention? Because we're not paying attention. Right? Pay attention. Your version may use the words give earnest heed, which is, I think, a, a little stronger of an interpretation there. I, I think that's more what the text is trying to get us to see. Pay close attention to what you have heard or give earnest heed all the more to what we have heard. If you want to stay in your lane on the highway, Church, this should be real simple. What do you got to do? Pay attention. Keep your eyes on the road. If you, keep, if you start looking around, this is the first thing my dad taught me when he taught me how to drive. Now, he did teach me the traffic laws. I don't, I don't want to throw him under the bus because he did teach me how to stop at stop signs. I just I didn't do it. Uh, in Bolivia, if you come up to a stop sign and there looks like nobody's coming, you just give a little honk and you just keep going forward. Or flash your lights at night. It, well, that works too. Um, doesn't work here as well. Just uh, throwing that out. You would get pulled over. But how do you stay in your lane? You keep, you keep your eyes on the road. You, you pay attention to the road. It's the first thing he taught me was, if you, if you see something and you, and you put your eyes on that thing, if you look at the headlights coming on, where is your car going to drift? You're going to drift into the other lane. If I'm looking at billboards, if I'm looking at the, the golden arches on the side of the road, if I'm looking at all these things, that, where am I going to drift? I'm going to go to where my eyes are fixed. And the truth is, in this world, this world is flashing neon lights at you every single turn. They're looking at you saying, look over here, look at this, look at this, uh, money and relationships and acceptance and identity. Look at all of these things. This is where you need to keep your eyes, and it's so easy to drift. It's, so, I, and it's easy for me to get up here and say, don't drift. But the truth is, we're pulled in a million directions every single day. Satan wants you to focus on what is less important. He's not going to make you focus on things that are unimportant. He's going to make you focus on things that are less important. So is school important? Careful. Got a lot of teachers and principals in here. School is important. Okay, listen. School is very important. But is it eternally the most important? No. Okay? Your friends, are they important? Yeah. Well, you're like, well, if you don't know, I, I, maybe you need to get some better friends. Are they, but are they eternally important? 
in, in, in the grand scheme of, of your arc toward Christ. No. Your identity, is it important? Yeah, it's important to know who you are and to know who, who you are in Christ. But is your identity the most important thing about you? Your identity in Christ is. But we do this. The devil wants us to look at the things that are less important and to focus in on them. And what happens is it derails us and takes us off the road. The moment we start looking at the other things, the, the scenery, the other cars, the billboards, your phone, a million other distractions, that's when we start to drift. If I had kept my eyes on the road, I would have spared myself quite a bit of uh, turmoil in, in my original accident that I had with that stop sign, or with the, the uh, text, texting sign. They did make me pay for it, so uh, kudos to uh, Baptist Temple in Springfield, Missouri, doing the right thing, making me pay for that thing. Um, that was, that was great. I didn't have a job, so also that was uh, fantastic. But look at it like this. If you, what you set your eyes on, that's where you're going to start to drift. Look what it says here. Okay, so verse 1, we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard so that we will not drift away. I've been using a lot of words that are about driving, but really in the original sense, both of these words, pay attention and drift away, are both nautical terms. So they would have described a purpose, the process of keeping a ship anchored in a safe harbor. That, that's what this is really describing. So the author of Hebrews is saying, listen, you've made it into safe harbor in Christ, so put your anchor down in Christ. Don't, don't, don't let the, the storms and the sea of this life dr- make you drift away from the safe harbor. So four ways to keep from drifting. The first one is this, understand that your salvation's price. Understand that you were bought at a great price. Second thing is this, recognize your sinful pride. Recognize your sinful pride. Everybody in the room got just a little bit on edge with me, didn't you? You're like, I'm not prideful. You don't talk about me like that. The first example was positive, okay? So here's, here's how to avoid. Second example is negative. Look at this, verse 2. Four, and then we're going we're gonna to break all this apart. Verses 2 and 3 form one thought, so I, I want to take them in pieces, but I want to look at it as a whole as well. If the message spoken through angels was legally binding, and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment. Let's, let's just talk about this for now. What, what are they talking about? What is the message that was delivered through angels? What's in view here? We talked about this last week. The message that was delivered through angels. This is the law of Moses. So that's, that's where we're, we're setting our eyes back to. Uh, we talked about the, the evidence both in Scripture and out of Scripture that God used angels in the delivery of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. So that's what's in, that's what's in view. We know it says here legally binding. Your version may say something like steadfast or reliable or really the New American Standard or the, the uh, Legacy Standard Bible uh, both use the words unalterable, and I think that's a great way to render this. But this is talking about the law. If the message spoken through angels, if the law was legally binding, why was it legally binding for the people? Why were the people of Israel legally bound? Why was it unalterable? Could they not break it? Let me ask you this. Did they break it? Yeah, frequently. We'll talk about that. It was legally binding because in Exodus chapter 24, You don't have to go there. I'm just going to read this to you. Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. It says, Moses took the covenant scroll, read it aloud to the people, and they responded this. All the people responded this. We will do and obey all the Lord has commanded. Given the context of the Old Testament, that's a very bold statement. We will do and obey all the Lord has commanded. They were legally bound to the law both the blessings and the curses of it. What's the problem, church? They couldn't keep it. They didn't keep it for one chapter. They made this declaration, we will do everything. There's not one thing that we won't do in the law. And then the next thing they're doing, they're looking and saying, I don't want to do that. I, there's some things that maybe I didn't read all the way through, and I'm not sure I want to do that. And they complain, they said, maybe we should go back to Egypt. Maybe we should do this. Maybe we should kill Moses. Maybe he's the problem here and not us. And then it's a cycle over and over and over. How many times do you see this in the Old Testament? The people sinned and disobeyed. God brought judgment. 
they brought an enemy to conquer them, and then the people cried out and said, Lord, please rescue us. And how did he respond? With rescue, he'd send a judge or he'd send a prophet or send someone to rescue them, and they would repent, and they would come back. They would say, okay, now we'll be obedient. And then the cycle would repeat again and 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 again. Seventeen times just in the book of Judges alone does this cycle get repeated. But throughout the Old Testament, we see it over and over. And we have a tendency, church, we have a tendency to look at them and say, I can't believe you guys, you scoundrels. We have a tendency to look and say, if I were there, I would never do anything like that. I would never bow down before another idol. I would never make a golden calf and worship it. I would never give uh, my sons and daughters in marriage to uh, foreign wives. I would never blaspheme the name of the Lord. I would never break the law. I would never do these things. Hogwash. We'd do it all. Church, we, we, we have this tendency to think that we're somehow more superior than these people, but we are not. We are not holier. We are not more morally upstanding. We are not more obedient. In and of ourselves, we are just the same as they are. And in fact, when uh, John Calvin talked about this section, he says this, men shall ever swell with inward pride because pride is so deeply rooted in our hearts. Don't be fooled. We are not more righteous than they are. Our sin captivates us and captures our flesh just like theirs did. Like, Pastor Mark, now you're yelling at me. Now you're aggressive with me. Listen, what, what was the penalty for it, though? If the message spoken through angels was legally binding, they agreed to the terms of those covenant, then what? Every transgression and disobedience received what, church? Just punishment. They, they were warned of it. They knew the results of this. They knew that if they broke the law, there was a curse that came with it. And look at this. There's no out in this. Transgression means to cross a line that you're not supposed to cross. So this is a sin of commission. You have now committed an act that you are not supposed to do. But then look at this. What's disobedience is not doing something the Lord has commanded you. That's a sin of omission. So there's no out here. There is a just punishment for both doing the things you're not supposed to do and not doing the things you are supposed to do. And it was a just punishment for this. And it leads us to this point, this sinful pride in our life. Sin in your life, it will cause you to drift away from the Lord. It will. I'm not saying it can or it might or it may if you let it go for so long. It will cause you to drift away from the Lord. And it does not start with some big, outrageous, blasphemous sin. Satan's not going to uh, come beside you and say, I would love for you today to stand up in church and just loudly and vocally blaspheme the name of the Lord. What would you say to that? No, I'm not doing that. That's crazy. I would never do that. But that's not, so he knows he's not going to get us in that way. So how does he start? With the stuff that doesn't seem that important. The stuff that, that you look for men. I'm going to talk to men for a second in here. That one little thought. That one little lustful thought. It's, 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 it doesn't hurt anybody. Nobody knows about it. It's so small. It's that one entertained thought. Now, I'm, it, it, it's, not like, it's not like it's anything horrible. It, it just, I, I thought it for a second. I, I thought about it a little bit more, and, and then I moved on. We think that's, that's not a big deal, but it snowballs, guys. It snowballs. And then before long, you're, you're knee-deep in an addiction to pornography. Your marriage is being affected by it. And eventually, you're going to commit adultery. I mean, already you've done it in your heart and in your mind, but you're going to commit adultery with your body as well. It's the way that it is. Sin causes us. It's, it, it, it gives, you give it an inch, and it's going to take a mile. It's going to take you way further than you thought it would. And then you're going to turn around, and you're going to say, how did I get this far? I, I, I was in church, and now I'm here. What happened? Or parents bring them to me, bring the teenagers to me, or bring them to Colt and say, fix my kid, I don't know what's wrong with them. And it's like, it, you, can't, you can't fix in a day what took 10 years to create. It starts small, church, but it grows. Okay, let's hit a little bit closer to home, everybody. All right, how about this, to neglect the faithful gathering of the saints. You say, it's just one Sunday, right? It's just, it's just once. It's just a couple of times here and there. Does, if I miss a couple of Sundays, it's not going to be a big deal. I'm telling you, it snowballs. You turn around and you've put all your priority on the things of this world and then you turn around and your kids are grown and they have no concept of what it means to faithfully gather with Christ's church. 
And then you've got a generation of grandkids who are being raised in functionally atheist homes. And you look as a grandparent and you say, what happened? Well, it's because it snowballs. It starts small with the things that you don't think are important and it creates something big. There is a just punishment for every transgression and disobedience. We've got to recognize our sinful pride. So you're sitting here this morning and you're probably thinking, Pastor, you, like, man, you're bashing us with this. Like, what do we, how, how could we stand against this? What do we do? If we're just as bad as Israel, how are we going to keep from making the same mistakes again and again and again and again? Thank you for asking. I've got some points for you. Think about this. Repent daily. Repentance should be one of the greatest tools in your toolbox. Colt, you've said it so many times. The Christian should love conviction and repentance. Repentance isn't a one-time thing where I come to Jesus and say, I'm sorry for all the sins I've done and have and are doing and will do and I'm washed clean and I never have to repent again. No, there's a reason why Lamentations 3.22 says his mercies are new every morning because there's the expectation that we will need them every morning. Repent daily. Go to the Lord. Find his forgiveness. It's available to you every single day. Second thing would be this. Practice honesty with your spouse or with the person who's closest to you, maybe your parents or whoever, if you're still living at home. Practice honesty. Listen, you hide things, and it's a slippery slope. My grandma would always write me when I was a teenager, and I've said this several times to you. Her advice to me was always, if you don't want to fall, stay out of slippery places. And as a teenager, that annoyed the heck out of me. I'd be like, what? where do you think I'm doing? Where do you think I'm going? But she cut deeper than she thought. You don't want to fall, stay out of slippery places. Practice honesty with somebody. Be honest with somebody. And that leads to number three. Bring someone in to keep you accountable. Don't, don't think that you can do this by yourself. You need somebody else. You need somebody else keeping up tabs on you, checking up on you, holding you accountable, knowing you, knowing the, the things that you struggle with so that they can come and ask hard questions about what you're struggling with. Fourth thing, church, look to the gospel. Look to the gospel. The gospel, again, isn't the thing that leads you to the kingdom. It is the kingdom itself. Be nourished and comforted by the promises of Christ's forgiveness. And then the last thing is this, stay in the Word. Stay in the Word. Adrian Rogers said this, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. So recognize your sinful pride. Number three, rejoice in your Savior's promise. Rejoice in your Savior's promise. So let's put it all together. If the message spoken through angels was legally binding, and every transgression and disobedience received just punishment because of that. Now this, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Escape what? Look at the context. Verse 2, what happened because of transgression and disobedience? Just punishment. How will we escape just punishment if we neglect such a great salvation? This is what he's saying. I want to make it as clear as I can. He's saying this. If a lesser covenant, the old covenant, the lesser covenant, which was delivered by lesser intermediaries, angels, brings judgment on those who break it. If that's true, then how much more severe will the punishment be for those who break a better covenant brought to us by a better mediator, Jesus Christ? The punishment for the rejection of the new covenant in Christ is death and eternal separation from God forever. This word punishment, just punishment here, it's used in other places, and more commonly it's used in the, in the positive as uh, the word wages or reward. So tell me, church, students of Scripture, what does Romans 6.23 tell us about the wages of sin? It's death. So if you see punishment in the Old Testament, and we do, we see frequent and severe punishment because of their transgression and disobedience, how much more today, because there is a better covenant brought by a better mediator, Jesus Christ, who paid a higher price, how much more severe is the judgment going to be? How do we get out of this? If you don't want to, be, if you, if you don't want to fall under the wrath and judgment of God this morning, what, what hope do you have? What do you do, church? Where, do you, where can we go? It, it, think about it like this. The people uh, that, that ridiculed uh, Noah for building the boat in the middle of dry ground, all of a sudden it started to rain and they found themselves in a terrible situation and it was too late. So as, as people here in this world today, there's a flood of judgment coming. Where can we run today? Is there a, a literal boat being built? No. So who is the spiritual 
boat that rescues us from the coming judgment. It's Jesus Christ himself. And so that's what he's focusing here on in this section. What the author of Hebrews is saying is that if you want to escape from those wages, from that end result, then the only way is through this great salvation that God has provided through the sacrifice of Jesus. How does that happen? Well, Jesus received the just punishment that your sin and my sin deserved so that we could come to him in faith and be forgiven, be cleansed of our sin, and our relationship with God be restored. This is the Savior's promise to you this morning. Man, if you don't hear anything else, hear that. There is salvation available to anyone, anywhere, anytime, through what Jesus did for you. And you might look at me and say, but you don't know what I've done. He does. And he still offers it to you. You say, but pastor, you don't know what has been done to me. He does. And worse was done to him. And he still offers it to you. And you say, but I don't think I can change. He does. He knows you can through the power of the Spirit, through the sacrifice that he made for you. There's no other way. You can't find it. You can look your whole life. You can work your fingers to the bone. You can pray so hard. You can pray on your knees for the next 80 years. You can do everything. You can tithe. You can be baptized. You can be baptized every week if you want. You can come back and be baptized again and again and again. Now, all that's going to happen is you're going to be perpetually wet. The good works that we do are not going to save you. The only way to be saved is to trust in the name of Jesus and the finished work that he completed on your behalf. There's no other way to escape this just punishment. Don't drift from that great promise. Nothing else is worthy of your focus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the one that made the salvation possible. Look at the end of verse 3. It says this. This salvation had its beginning where? Where is salvation's origin? Is it in me and my will and my ability and my willingness to be saved and ask Jesus into my heart? No. Where does it start? This salvation had its beginning with the Lord. When it was spoken of by the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Jesus is the source of your salvation. He's the one who accomplished it for you. When it says here it was confirmed to us by those who heard him, what does this tell us about the author of Hebrews? That he didn't hear it directly from Jesus himself. It was confirmed to us by those who heard it. So this is a second generation believer. One of the apostles heard Jesus speak, shared the gospel with the writer of Hebrews. He believed, and now he is sharing the gospel with others. Isn't this cool? I I I thought about this this week. Jesus shared the gospel with his disciples. They shared the gospel. They shared the gospel. They shared the gospel. In an all, a long, unbroken line for the last 2,000 years, who was it that shared the gospel with you? I want to hear it. Who was the first person that led you to faith in Christ? Your parent? Your dad? Okay, fantastic. Who else? The spouse? Youth group. All right. So, uh, yeah, a youth pastor or pastor? Parents, uh, spouse, youth pastor, pastor, teacher, um, neighbor. I don't, I don't know. There's, there's lots of different ones. Think about who was the one who shared the gospel with you. Now think about this because I, I want you to be a part of somebody else's story. I, I want somebody else in 20 years to look back and say, I know who it was. It was, it was this person. And they shared the gospel. It's an, a long, unbroken line. And it leads to this. It's a beautiful picture of what faith in Jesus Christ looks like. But it can't, this, the work of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, the promise of the gospel cannot be a Sunday morning every once in a while reminder. It's not something that you come and be like, oh yeah, I forgot about the gospel. Okay, I'm good now. I'm going to come back at Easter and, and forget about it until then. Rejoice in the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. A heart that is fixed on Jesus, anchored in Jesus, will not drift. Martin Luther said, show me a man who questions why he needs to hear the gospel again. And I will show you a man who most desperately needs to hear it again. Last thing, church. Be strengthened by the Spirit's provision. Be strengthened by the Spirit's provision. Verse 4, at the same time, so as, as the gospel was spoken of by the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Verse 4, at the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles, and the distribution of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. 
I, I love this. What, what he's saying here is as that early church was being built, and as the first believers were coming to faith in Jesus and the first churches were being established, the Holy Spirit was present in a miraculous way. He was there bringing signs and wonders, prophetic words and, and uh, 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 tongues being uh, uttered and uh, healings and different things. It says uh, about uh, Paul that if a shadow pass over a person, it would heal them. And this amazing thing, I do not believe that those same miracles are happening today. I believe that what this is saying here is it was confirmed during this time to, to confirm the message of the gospel. We have the message of the gospel in its entirety. We have God's communication to us. We don't need those signs and gifts anymore. And so then our question could be today, well, then what's the role of the Holy Spirit today? Because that's, that's how usually Pentecostals, Charismatics, they would look at us and say, well, you, you, don't, you barely even acknowledge the Spirit. No, absolutely. The, the work of salvation is, is a, the cr- a crucial work of the Spirit. Today, what does the Spirit do? He draws his people to Jesus. That's what he's doing everywhere at all times, drawing his people to Jesus. Uh, no man comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him or unless he's drawn to him first. Okay, so... Uh, what does the Spirit do? He draws his people to Jesus, and when he does, he convicts them of their sin. He convinces them of the righteousness of Christ. When he regenerates their hearts, he becomes the seal and the down payment of their redemption. He is your comforter and your counselor. He supernaturally enables you to bring glory to God, and he gives you gifts to serve the church. He's sanctifying you right now. You're like, right now, right now, right now. You say, but I don't feel sanctified. Well, listen, you don't, your feelings are, are, are sinful. I mean, they're, they're prone to sin and our interpretation in, in our brokenness. You can't rely on your feelings. Don't ever trust someone when they say, follow your heart. That's the worst advice you could ever receive because your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Follow Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ. Anchor yourself in Christ. And as you do, the Spirit is sanctifying you. So here's here's the amazing thing, church, and I I am finished here. The amazing thing is this. It's not about your willpower. You're like, I don't know if I'm strong enough to battle the addiction that's in my life right now. Yeah, you're probably not. But the Spirit is. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Philippians 1.6, the one who started the good work in you, what will he do? Finish it. He'll carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The Spirit's provision, daily provision, is keeping you from drifting. All right, I'm done. Praise Him, why don't you come up and lead us in a song of invitation. Here's my challenge for you. This is what I want you to do. It's time for some honest self-reflection. Okay? I'm not talking about turning around and sharing all the skeletons in your closet with everybody around you. I'm talking about this, self-reflection. Is this warning for you? Have you drifted away from the Lord? Are you sitting here this morning saying, he might as well be speaking to me. The the writer of Hebrews might as well be telling my life story because I have drifted so far away from the Lord. My challenge for you, take this opportunity in a song of response. Pray and come back. What's, What's stopping you? Nothing. There's mercy available for you. There's grace available to you. If you're a true believer in Jesus Christ and the Spirit still indwells you, still drawing you back to Christ. Don't, don't, don't let what you've done or what's been done to you stop you from coming back to Jesus Christ. You might be looking around the room and saying, well, somebody in this room hurt me. Did Jesus hurt you? No. So come back to Jesus. Get things right. If you've drifted away from the Lord this morning, my invitation to you is to come back. If you, this morning you say, I, my relationship with Jesus has been stronger, is stronger than it's ever been, fantastic. Worship the Lord this morning then for his miraculous gift, because you're not doing it on your own. It's the Spirit in you. Self-reflection. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his supernatural ability to discern where we are. Father, you know me way deeper than, than anybody else. You know me better than I know myself. You knew, you knew uh, when I would wake up this morning and when I'm going to go to bed, you know every step that I'm going to take, every word that I'm going to say. You know the deep things in my heart that I guard and shield from everyone. You know who I am, and, and I am laid bare before you. And so I pray this morning that you would forgive me. 
where I have failed you, where I have sinned by transgression and by disobedience. I pray that, Lord, you'd remind me every day of your gospel promise that there is forgiveness available in Jesus Christ. Draw me to his heart. For our church, Lord, I do pray that we wouldn't pursue holiness for the sake of being good people, but we would pursue Christ and find holiness along the way. Pray that you'd help us to anchor our hearts in you and to not drift away. Thank you for this word and thank you for your promises, your gospel promises to us. They are good and glorious. And we bring it all back to you. You are the source of our salvation. If somebody in this room doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that today they would repent of their sins and trust in the name of Jesus. It's in his blessed name we pray.